The mystery of how Polynesian communities came to settle some of the most isolated islands on Earth has long fascinated archaeologists, geneticists, and explorers alike. From the very first European encounters with these master navigators, thriving on remote islands scattered across the Pacific. One question loomed, how did they get here? How could a population whose ancestry traces back to Southeast Asia, possibly as far north as Taiwan, manage to span a marine territory larger than all the world's continents combined? These weren't isolated drifts. Long before the compass or sextant, they sailed deliberately, constructing double-hulled canoes, charting invisible star maps, and planting new civilizations across more than 10 million square miles of ocean. Some once claimed they were lucky castaways. Others suggested lost continents or magical winds. But today, modern science tells a deeper story, rooted in DNA, pottery shards, oral memory, and wind-scarred sea roots. In this video, we're not just revisiting the well-known theory. We're peeling back the waves and exposing a forgotten world of strategy, resilience, and innovation, hidden beneath centuries of coral and silence. Because the Polynesians didn't just survive in the Pacific, they redefined what was humanly possible. The story of the Polynesians begins not on the open ocean, but in the highlands and river valleys of ancient Taiwan. Around 6,000 years ago, an agricultural revolution was quietly unfolding. Neolithic communities were domesticating rice, millet, pigs, and dogs. But something was about to disrupt their world. As sea levels rose during the Holocene climate optimum, large portions of coastal Taiwan were swallowed by the ocean. Villages disappeared, farmlands flooded. The result? A forced migration. These displaced communities didn't retreat. They innovated, they built canoes, they learned how to follow the ocean's rhythms, and they took their knowledge of farming, animal husbandry, and tool making with them. This was the beginning of what scientists now call the Austronesian expansion, a vast human movement that would eventually stretch from Madagascar to Easter Island. But before crossing the Pacific, the ancestors of the Polynesians made one critical stop, the Batanis Islands, a small but strategic archipelago north of the Philippines. Why does this obscure location matter? Because archaeologists have found early pottery, pig bones, and obsidian tools here that bridge the gap between Taiwan and the rest of island Southeast Asia. This was their launch pad, a proving ground for life at sea. From Batans, the migration fanned southward, through the Philippines, then into the heart of what we now call island Southeast Asia. Along the way, these voyagers absorbed cultural and genetic threads from local populations, leaving behind a trail of languages and stone tools that still echo across the islands today. Interestingly, early linguistic studies, largely overlooked in popular media, show that certain proto-oceanic numerals and kinship terms appear not only in Polynesia, but also in Micronesian and Formosan dialects. This challenges the simplified, southward-only model of migration and suggests dual influences, east and west, north and south. So while many documentaries trace a neat arc from Taiwan to Tonga, the truth is messier and far more fascinating. What began as a climate-driven exodus morphed into one of the most ambitious, multi-phase expansions in human history, guided not by kings or empires, but by farmers, navigators, and families chasing stability across shifting tides. By the time the Austronesian voyagers reached the Bismarck Archipelago, something extraordinary was taking shape. A new cultural engine, later known as the Lapita culture, was assembling the toolkit for true oceanic colonization. The Lapita people weren't just travelers. They were ecological engineers biocultural architects. Armed with knowledge of horticulture, animal husbandry, navigation, and craftsmanship, they built floating civilizations, ready for replication on any new island they touched. They carried with them more than food staples. 
They transported entire agricultural systems, taro and breadfruit seedlings, yam cuttings, piglets, dogs, and jungle fowl chicks, and even soil microbes in coconut husks to fertilize future farms. But what we know the Lapita for most, their distinctive pottery, red, geometric, and dentate, stamped with tiny comb tools. Found across 4,000 kilometers of ocean, these ceramic calling cards are like breadcrumbs marking the path of their movement. And these weren't random designs. Archaeologists now believe many Lapita motifs encode symbolic meaning, possibly clan identifiers, navigation cues, or religious markings. More impressively, pottery thickness and capacity ratios were nearly identical across sites, suggesting calibrated design standards for storing water and food. For decades, scholars debated where the Lapita came from. Were they Asian migrants who absorbed Melanesian culture? Or were they Melanesians who adopted Austronesian language and sailing tech? In 2016, ancient DNA analysis from Lapita burials in Vanuatu and Tonga gave us an answer. The earliest Lapita individuals, some dating back over 2,800 years, carried almost 100% Asian genetic ancestry. Little to no Melanesian DNA was present in this founding population. This meant the first Lapita voyagers moved fast, skipping extensive contact with local Melanesians, heading east with precision. But they didn't stay isolated forever. Between 1,900 and 1,200 years ago, another major genetic event occurred, a Melanesian admixture wave, introduced during return migrations or through intermarriage on hub islands like Fiji and the Solomons. And the Lapita weren't just cultural vectors. They were scientific observers. Recent findings suggest they may have mapped ocean currents using floating driftwood and shell models and even tracked seasonal changes in sea temperature based on fish migration patterns. In short, the Lapita didn't blindly leap into the Pacific. They measured it, modeled it, mastered it. Their pottery, crops, and genes built the scaffolding for what would later become the most widespread cultural footprint in oceanic history, Polynesia. For years, the genetic story of Polynesians was framed as a simple blend, mostly Southeast Asian, about 70 to 80%, mixed with 20 to 30% Melanesian ancestry. But modern genome-wide studies are showing it's more complex and more fascinating. While the majority of Polynesian ancestry does come from island Southeast Asia, new data reveals small but consistent traces of ancestry from northern China and even Austroasiatic speaking regions like Vietnam and Cambodia. Even more intriguing is the gender based pattern in Polynesian DNA. Most Polynesian mitochondrial DNA, inherited from mothers, traces back to Asia, especially the B4A101 lineage, known as the Polynesian motif. But their Y chromosomes, passed from fathers, are often Melanesian. This points to a sex-biased mixing. More Melanesian men than women joined the population as it moved eastward. Why this imbalance? Possibly through intermarriage, alliances, or even hostage-taking during early contacts in Melanesia. What's also striking is what's missing. Some ancient Y chromosome lines found in Lapita burial sites no longer exist in modern Polynesians. They vanished, likely due to bottlenecks or founder effects, where only a few individuals carried surviving lineages forward. This narrowing of diversity created a genetic paradox, a population with roots in many places, but shaped by isolation and repetition across generations. Even today, Polynesian genetics reveals unique traits, like enhanced starch digestion and disease resistance that likely evolved from life in isolated island ecosystems. Their DNA tells a story of movement, mixing, and survival. Not a straight line, but a web of migrations, filtered by the ocean and sharpened by time. Polynesian migration wasn't luck, it was design. At the heart of their expansion were the double-hulled voyaging canoes vessels engineered for performance, stability, and survival. These weren't crude rafts, 
where massive trees were available, hulls were carved from single trunks. But in smaller islands, they built complex vessels from planks, stitched, lashed, and waterproofed using tree sap and coconut fiber. The secret weapon? The crab claw sail, a unique inverted triangular design that could harness wind from multiple directions. This wasn't just effective, it was fast. Modern reconstructions like the Hokulea have reached speeds of 10 to 15 knots, rivaling modern sailboats. A 2023 study confirmed that Polynesian five-shaped double hulls outperformed outrigger canoes in upwind sailing, making return voyages possible, even against prevailing winds. But sailing was only part of the story. These canoes were floating ecosystems, carrying pigs, chickens, taro plants, coconuts, even water sealed in gourds. They supported entire communities for weeks at sea, and perhaps most astonishing was their navigation. Without maps or compasses, Polynesian wayfinders memorized hundreds of stars and their rising positions. They read ocean swells, watched cloud shapes over islands, and followed the morning and evening flights of seabirds. All this was passed down orally, through chants, hand gestures, and rituals. It was knowledge encoded in rhythm, not ink. Today, this legacy lives on. The rebirth of traditional navigation isn't nostalgia, it's proof. Proof that the Polynesians didn't just cross the Pacific. They decoded it, one wave, one star, one canoe at a time. For years, the strongest clue of contact between Polynesia and the Americas came down to a humble root, the sweet potato. Known as Kumara across Polynesia, this crop is native to South America. And here's the twist. It was already thriving in Polynesian gardens long before any European ships crossed the Pacific. Botanically, it couldn't have floated over. Sweet potatoes rot quickly in seawater. So how did they get there? Linguistics offers a hint. The word Kumara is nearly identical to Kumar or Kumal, used in Quechua and Aymara, languages of the Andes. Still, skeptics needed hard proof. Then, in 2020, a groundbreaking DNA study published in Nature changed everything. It found clear traces of Native American ancestry in the genomes of modern Polynesians, specifically from the Marquesas and other eastern islands. The genetic contact was dated to around 1200 AD, aligning almost perfectly with archaeological estimates for sweet potato spread. But here's what most videos never mention. That contact didn't happen on Easter Island, the Polynesian island closest to South America. Instead, it likely happened farther west, in the Marquesas. This suggests something bold. Polynesians were the voyagers, not South Americans. Even more surprising? Some Polynesian artifacts, like bark cloth and certain coastal petroglyphs, show designs closely matching Andean motifs. The exchange wasn't just botanical, it was biological and cultural. Polynesians didn't just bring home sweet potatoes. They may have returned with people, stories, and seeds that would shape their agricultural future, especially in cooler places like New Zealand, where Kumara became the backbone of Maori farming. This wasn't a one-time contact. It was one of humanity's most underestimated voyages, a round trip across the world's largest ocean. For nearly 2,000 years, Polynesians pushed farther and farther into the Pacific, settling islands thousands of miles apart, mastering winds, stars, and waves. Then, they stopped. No new islands were settled after around 1300 AD, not even those within sailing distance. Why? One possible answer lies in the sky, climate change. Around the 14th century, the Pacific entered a cooling phase known as the Little Ice Age. Trade winds shifted, sea routes became less predictable, and tropical crops like breadfruit began to struggle in fringe environments like New Zealand. Archaeological layers from this period show signs of resource stress, increased fortification of villages, more reliance on root crops, and in some islands, 
population crashes due to isolation and famine. Oral traditions from places like Hawaii and Rapa Nui speak of the ocean turning away or the sky closing. Cryptic phrases that may reflect this sudden shift in environment and fortune. There's also evidence of social change. As the climate cooled, Polynesian societies became more rigid. Religious systems centralized around high priests and taboo laws. Innovation slowed. Voyaging knowledge, once passed from master to apprentice, became secretive or lost entirely on some islands. By the time Europeans arrived in the 1700s, many islanders still carried the memory of past voyages, but no longer the means to repeat them. What ended the expansion wasn't failure. It was a recalibration, a shift from outward ambition to internal survival. The Pacific didn't get smaller, but for a time, the Polynesians chose to sail inward into myth, memory, and preservation. Even when genetics and archeology span fall silent, Polynesian memory speaks through language, chants, and oral tradition. Every Polynesian language, from Hawaiian to Maori to Tahitian, belongs to the oceanic branch of the Austronesian language family. And despite being scattered across thousands of miles, these languages are closely related, suggesting a recent and rapid migration. But language wasn't just a tool for communication. It was a vessel of navigation. Polynesian navigators memorized star maps, ocean currents, and island positions not on paper, but in poetry and rhythm. Take Tuvalu, for example. Its oral chants encode the positions of 21 islands, their direction, distance, and sailing conditions. Modern GPS has confirmed these oral maps were over 85% accurate. Their stories also preserved migration history. Legends of ancestors arriving in canoes named Tainui, Te Arawa, or Hokulea often match archaeological timelines and settlement layers. Some chants even describe landfall at night, star positions, or struggles at sea, clues that align with actual oceanographic data. And while many oral histories blend myth with memory, their core truths, migration, survival, and identity, remain intact. Even material culture follows linguistic lines. Stone tools, fishing hooks, and house styles evolve gradually across island chains, just like dialects do. Together, they form a hidden archive, encoded not in libraries, but in lived experience. In a world where civilizations often wrote their history in stone, Polynesians wrote theirs in stars, salt, and syllables. The story of the Polynesians isn't just about migration. It's about precision without metal, memory without maps, and navigation without borders. From Taiwan to Tonga, Samoa to South America, they didn't just move people. They moved language, agriculture, DNA, and meaning across the largest ocean on Earth. Their double-hulled canoes were laboratories. Their chants were encyclopedias. Their islands connected not by roads, but by routes written in the stars. And while empires rose and fell on land, Polynesians carved out a civilization in motion, a legacy of exploration that reshaped the boundaries of what humans could imagine and then do. If this story moved you, subscribe to Stone and Bone. Because in every ancient migration, every myth, and every forgotten genome, there's a truth waiting to surface.